Line. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Fast my good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. We're open line today. Remember, tomorrow, Chief Exec of Manx Care, Teresa Cope, will be on Man in Line. So any questions you want to put to Teresa, you can either uh, take your chances tomorrow live on the air or get them in in the meantime by emailing maninline at manxradio.com or call the answer phone on 682-631. But today, open line... One thing everybody's talking about, it is the second reading of uh, the assisted dying bill in the House of Keys today. Crowds of people have been making their voices heard about the assisted dying bill. Uh, second reading in front of MHKs today. Uh, if you've got any thoughts on the matter, please get in touch. Text, email, call and WhatsApp. As many opinions as possible we'd like to get on the air and just to hear what you have to say. If there's anything else, of course there's uh, other things uh, in the news. Um, uh, Really, if you want to bring up, uh, have you had visitors this year? What was their impression of the Isle of Man? One MHK says we need to up our game when it comes to the visitor experience. (laughs) That is, well, you could mention the horse trams. You could mention the seaweed all over Douglas Promenade. You could mention the brownfield sites. Perhaps you could mention the lack of uh, some visitor facilities. But then again, Top Tune A, the Manx celebration uh, that sees the uh, sees in the Celtic New Year, All Saints Day, All Hallows Eve it is. So any thoughts on any of that, by all means, uh, get in touch. And also a, a note uh, in just to say, uh, uh, this is from Jewin who just said, why do we have people interfering with our government debates for a system? of the assisted dying uh, bill. Uh, It's our body, it's our choice. Uh, Some pressure groups uh, from across have been having their say over here. Do you think it's our business or are they entitled to an opinion? I'm Sarah Wooten and I'm Chief Executive of Dignity in Dying. This is about choice and compassion for dying people. Without the option of assisted dying, some dying people will suffer at the end of life. There are concerns that we'd become Death Island. What do you say to that? Alex has been absolutely clear that this will be a law that's available only to the dying people of the Isle of Man and there will be a residency requirement. So we know that one Briton is going every week to Switzerland to control their end of life. The other thing that some people do is take matters into their own hands in increasingly desperate and violent ways. It's appalling. What happens with a, with a law, hardly anyone chooses it. There would only be a couple of people every year who would be likely to have an assisted death on the Isle of Man, but it would actually make these conversations so much more open and transparent about how people want to die. My name is Jan Sheath. I'm really concerned about this bill because of what's happening elsewhere and the, the vulnerable we should just be protecting vulnerable people, not hastening their death. There's a fabulous <laughs> hospice here, and the community support it so well. Why not support that? Why not be more caring about the vulnerable and the dying? This is a dreadful thing to do. Do you not think that people should have a say? If they have been diagnosed with a terminal illness, they should have a say in how they leave this world? Of course they should. But but that, that is not what this this whole thing is about, is it? Really? Martin Perkins, HMHK for Garth. I believe in personal choice and I've always believed that people should have autonomy over themselves. I've spoken to a number of doctors, a number of people involved medically about it all. They appreciate that if they don't want to get involved, they can. But there is also a lot of doctors and medics that are for it but do not want to raise their head above the parapet. Well, you say that, but the Isle of Man Medical Society surveyed its doctors and three quarters of them said that they don't support the bill and actually it would mean that 34% of those would actually want to leave the island. So there is genuine concern amongst doctors there, surely? Only 60% of the doctors replied to the survey in the first place. 
and the rest of the Western world have got this more or less in some form or other and we are lagging behind in that regard. Hi, I'm John Shee. There's no one joining the dots. The government has a policy on how to prevent suicide and yet it's blind to this. In every country that have implemented an assisted dying bill, they have introduced laxer rules immediately. The problem is it, it's, it's, it's too quick. At the very least, kick it to a select committee and have proper debate with more than just one person. Oh, what do you think about this? A call, text, email and WhatsApp. Do you think Martin Perkins, the former MHK, is right? There are people who aren't putting their head above the parapet. They agree with it, but they're not saying that they agree with it because they feel they may get shouted down. Other subject, really. Mark dropped a note in I, uh, in, a, uh, in a response to a question in Timwell. The chief minister claimed we'd have to start to become green in terms of our electrical energy production by 2026 and fully so by 2030. Uh, how does the chief minister propose to achieve this without any plan for green energy that can only produce some energy when it's windy enough and not too windy and when the sun shines? These two plans are wind and solar. Even when the above set of conditions are met, i.e. when it's windy enough but not too windy and when the sun shines, they can't provide our full electrical power demands. So there has to be another source of green energy that the Chief Minister isn't telling us about. It'll need to provide about uh, 75 to 100% of our needs at any one time. And that's only if the wind turbines and solar panels ever get out of planning due to the likely objections. The Alabama Energy Plan claims that we will be using biogas, i.e. biologically produced methane, domestic waste decomposition from next year. But I don't see any sign of such a thing even being planned, let alone implemented. Does anybody know if there's any biogas in the pipe anywhere? And what will be the source of this gas? I doubt that that enough gas could ever be produced from our domestic waste. Uh, the Alaman Energy Plan also optimistically claims that within a few years from now, large amounts of hydrogen will be available. Uh, and Mark says this is wishful thinking. It takes far more energy to produce hydrogen gas, presumably from water, than you get from its burning, which it re- returns it, of course, to become water. So where's all the energy to make the hydrogen going to come from? And what will produce the energy that you'll need for the hydrogen. I could explain further, but I'll stop there. The bottom line is, says Mark, I think that the chief minister uh, claims that strategy, his strategy, isn't worthy of the name. It's nothing more than a kind of hodgepodge of wishful thinking. The truth is that hidden from view, we'd be reliant on power coming from the cable from Bispam in Blackpool. And Bispam, the cable from Blackpool, will be our main source of electricity called power as the UK like every other country can't fully pr- uh, provide green energy and of course ours won't be either well do you have any thoughts on this obviously we're being uh, pushed towards using renewables on the Isle of Man the Eristain and Scard site is, seems to be the favoured one for putting a wind farm but that's going to require planning now it may be that you know the planning will just kind of happen you know like Manx Development Corporation decide they're going to build a village around Westmoreland Road and then you know it may just happen so what do you think where this is concerned do you think it's wind do you think it's solely do you think it's offshore wind or stead the people who want to uh, you know perhaps put a, a wind farm in our territorial waters and we'll get the money from that except at the moment nobody's told us how much money we're going to get from renting our seabed to orsted and whether or not it will provide enough energy and where indeed that energy is going to come ashore. If Orsted put a wind farm in our territorial waters, will it just link up with the many wind farms there are in the North Irish Sea and end up going into the UK national grid or will it come ashore here and be um, you know, corrected to the, the, the voltage and the power and what have you uh, that, that we require here so will that come ashore anywhere? Will it, will it indeed you know, fit into the infrastructure for the interconnector that we have literally a couple of hundred yards away from Manx Radio. 
all thoughts to mull over, really, regarding power, regarding energy and green energy. But certainly, uh, I don't agree with a sister dying, says John. Nobody's stopping my body, my choice, ending their lives if they wish. But don't expect or force others to do it for them. John on 404. Um, and uh, have you heard the news about what the King has done? Prorogue Parliament hasn't happened since 1951. What's going on? Says, um, uh, was that Manxwell? I think your uh, your message has split up. Anyway, yes, it is true. Uh, a little background that the King Charles has prorogued Parliament in the UK. A uh, statement was read out on behalf of King Charles in uh, the House of Lords to mark the end of the most recent parliamentary session. The Parliament was formally prorogued uh, on Thursday, wasn't it? The first time it's been done by a king in more than seven decades, the first prorogation of Parliament in the UK since the death of Queen Elizabeth II last September. It comes just weeks after UK MPs return from their parliamentary conference recess, but they're now going to get another short break from attending the House of Commons. What does it mean? Parliament runs in sessions that generally last for about a year, although the, the length can vary. The act of proroguing Parliament brings to an end the current parliamentary session over there with a short break before the new session. It doesn't really affect us, but uh, I've answered your question. Uh, thank you for that. That was Crystal uh, for that. And uh, in the light of... Uh, well, thank you, Crystal. Is anybody feeling anger because of this deception? <laughs> Well, it's happening across there, Chris. So I don't think they're doing it to spite us. Even if they wanted to, uh, it doesn't really affect us that much. Has the Isle of Man uh, gone mad regarding this? Uh, if they brought in this act, I think it's disgusting. Uh, I'd like to... Uh, uh, this is Lizzie as well. This is, going to, the, this is going to ruin our island, says Lizzie. So there we are. With the assisted dying bill, there should be a referendum to see how many residents feel like this. A consultation, I think, is inadequate uh, for this type of topic, says Roger on 289. Uh, David's with us now. Hi, David. Hi, Randy. I just want to put a, a plea out there for uh, scams um, and rogue phone calls. I mean, yesterday I had one from the UK and, of course, uh, I always try and check the phone when I'm uh, not driving uh, to see this. And I just wonder where people are out there now. We need to warn the population. Of, uh, I've had one about 20 minutes ago. He was a foreign uh, gentleman uh, from um, uh, any, uh, an African country, I think, and uh, asked me that. Uh, and the, the trick is, I think, is he say, well, you called me. And I said to the person, uh, no, I've never called you. Who are you? And I just want to tell people out there, you need to be so careful, even with the emails. And I just wonder whether it's because we've had telecom up and down, you know, Manx Telecom, and the internet service going uh, haywire in different places. Was this, a, uh, was this a mobile or a landline, David? No, it was a uh, mobile. We che I checked them on the, the internet. The One of them was... It's a, an organization somewhere. But when you try and click on it on, face, say, Facebook to, to try and find it, it's legitimate. The website's been taken down. Right. And that's what worries me a little bit is when somebody's got a, a mobile phone and uh, when they click back to people or they say, you know, give us a ring, you know, this could be to your advantage or something like that. People are going to obviously try it. And then you're clicking up a pound a minute or I don't know what they are sometimes. But I just wonder why on the island itself, when we have two providers, well, three, I think, we've still got uh, Shure, Manx Telecom and uh, Ymanx, which I'm connected with. Uh, why we can't stop these? Why can't we have a, a, an agreement or uh, somewhere where if that's a number coming in and it's been used quite regularly and we know it's a scammer one, why aren't they blocked? Hmm. I, I, wonder. I mean, I, I'm sure I've heard in the past that the telecoms companies do an enormous amount in terms of blocking because we often get targeted. I think these people target jurisdictions and so they'll they'll turn on and then obviously, as you say, Max Telecom, Shaw and Wimax have to then up their defences on our behalf. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but uh, uh, it, it happens, it comes through. I mean, it's, it's, it's a matter of fact that it, dialing nowadays is quite easy if you get 
a computer program and a little mini yeah. um, d- uh, mini exchange, then off you go and they can just sit there. Did you ask them yeah. what they were selling, by the way? I didn't. Um, uh, when I heard the, the tone of his attitude that you, you rang me, and I was at um, a, a pensions group meeting this morning, and I, I've never rang anybody this morning because I always put the phone on silent. So he, he was talking uh, out of field as such. He, I, I've never uh, called. Why would I call some of the English numbers? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, and I've said to you before in the past, the only one I tried is regarding free panels for the roof, PV panels. Yeah. And you had a UK resident. <laughs> but that person was fairly open and honest you know, and said to me, I said to him straight away well I say to people, do you know I live in the Isle of Man? He said, well it's not for you then is yes. it? Yes, <laughs> it's simple. Alright, thanks for calling today uh, 22 minutes past 12 there's been a, a, a spate of these recently in fact yesterday I got two text messages two text messages saying that this was from Royal Mail and your package can't be delivered uh, if you don't press this link, actions will be taken, so straight away that will trigger you to think, well that's a bit extreme that wouldn't be the Royal Mail sending and how would they know my number anyway? And obviously once you click those, then you're in either they're going to download some malware onto your phone or you may be in, uh, maybe there's somewhere that they can target your payment systems if you have them on your phone or on the wallet on your phone so just be aware just be aware it happens all the time uh, i often go back i've got a, a a telephone landline and often go back to two or three messages uh, just to, and they're just trying it on it's numbers you don't recognize numbers from uh, elsewhere not indeed in the uk but they're trying it on so something we have to be aware of if you've had any recently then by all means uh, get in touch actually if you've got any screenshots of them then do get in touch and tell us who's targeting the Isle of Man at the moment uh, I don't think it's entirely us <laughs> I think they're equal opportunity scammers, they'll do anybody if they think there's some money in it and really that's it, but the key is if you get what looks like a suspicious email or uh, a message then do not click on the link whatever you do, don't click on the link delete it completely get it off your phone or your computer because that could be downloading all sorts of stuff in the future it may be some malware that will wait until you put in a credit card detail in the future can scam that can scrape that and use it elsewhere so please do that nowadays whenever you're doing payments on the phone certainly and on an app uh, the banks are getting very touchy about sending money and will ask you two and three times to click this approve that and swear blind that it's going to somebody that you know so really just be sensible with it Uh, a message in from uh, Derek who just said has the Newcastle Town Road reopened yet not that we know of the Newcastle Town Road resurfacing from Spring Valley Roundabout to the bottom of Richmond Hill I don't think it's finished the poor weather put it off and uh, they can't lay the asphalt in time or didn't lay the asphalt on some days so it didn't reopen last Friday didn't reopen yesterday if they have suitable weather over the next few days they can expect to open the road by the middle of this week which is tomorrow so and also it needs to be line painted as well and the correct markings on the section of the carriageway are critical to road safety because it's that sort of road and uh, will you miss cutting through by the energy from race waste plants it's been like the old days hasn't it just to get through and 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 drive through that uh more messages in also concerning the um assisted dying bill uh, oh and by the way thank you brian i've just got the same royal mail scam text and just deleted how do they get hold of your number uh brian completely random they've got a computer program they'll just go through numbers and send them to as many as possible so it's it's purely a computer program that they have like the people who just go through numbers have you noticed often if you get one of those scam calls it'll be 20 seconds before anybody speaks to you because they'll be calling 20 or 30 numbers at any one time so uh, fine uh, my son lives abroad says nick on 266 came back to the isle of man for a few days in the summer he couldn't believe how run down douglas was we sat in the lovely seating area outside the sefton and our outlook was a run down decayed building scruffy looking smelly prom this is our city. 
So we went to Port Aaron, completely different story. Beautiful beach, pretty town, and no horrible smell that you get on Douglas Promenade. He said if he were coming here for a holiday, Douglas Prom would be the first thing that he'd see. He wouldn't want to get off the boat. It's a shame, and surely something needs to be done where this is concerned. We've uh, been trying for a couple of days to get somebody from Douglas Council to talk about the smelly seaweed. Answer, came there none. I got the same or similar text supposedly from the Royal Mail, blocked the number and sent the details to the OCSIA, the um, cyber security people, the OCSIA. And Graham said, um, it's a Graham Fox Hume, the geologist and geophysicist. Why do our civil servants and politicians never, never mention geothermal energy? We've got the same geological position here as they do in Cornwall, where the Eden Project already uses it through the United Downs. Well, wind and solar farms are absolutely the wrong way to go, technically, economically and visually. Onshore, they create no-go areas, intolerable noise, vibration. And they'd ruin the Isle of Man, says Graham, both for our population and for visitors. Offshore, there are no-go areas for shipping and fishing. There, So there goes uh, our scallop industry. And also, they devastate the bird population, Graham's words, both on and offshore, some of which are protected species. And we have bats on the Isle of Man as well. Geothermal is clean. It's green, doesn't produce carbon dioxide. It's unobtrusive, scalable, 24-7, 365, a lifetime in the hundreds of years so nobody seems to be talking about geothermal well not with any great volume do they you never hear politicians hanging their hat on geothermal Thanks also to um, the the scams are relentless, says uh, Texter 717. Thank you. A family member gets dozens of these calls every day. If anyone wants to know more about the scammers, uh, check the programme on the BBC. It's called Scam Interceptors. Thanks also to uh, we need uh, we need to expect more disruption and hardship with supplies on and off the Isle of Man uh, due to the fact that the storms are geoengineered. How do they do that? How does anybody? Ge- I mean, you can seed clouds, but I mean, on on that sort of scale, where does it happen? Where does it happen and who's doing it? It's not the World Health Organization, is it? Is it? It's not the Bilderberg Group. We're not into a conspiracy theory, are we? We'll see anyway. Yes, the bogus Royal Mail send messages for parcels. They may have some software access to Manx delivery companies, says John. But if you get something, particularly with a Royal Mail thing, if it says, like the one I got, two I got yesterday, saying there will, we will have to take actions or there will be actions, you know, no re- reputable company would ever speak to you like that. So we'll see. Uh, Douglas isn't a city yet, says Andy. They've not had the letters patent. And until they do, and Tim will pass as a new act, Douglas is not a city. So isn't it false representation for the council to say it is a city? We'll put that on the list of questions, Andy, that we put to Douglas Council that as yet we don't have any answer for. Mark's on now. Hi, Mark. Hello, Andy. How you doing, fella? Good, thanks. Good. Right. Listen, I'm just wanting to point out a little thing that happened to me the other day, which I was shocked about, and I think your listeners need to know about it too. Um, I mean, I've been a long time critic of the police on the island. I, I don't actually think that they do a very good job. But the other day, I rang up the police to uh, report a minor incident. You know, nothing major. It wasn't a 999 incident or anything. Now, first of all, it took me at least 10, 15 minutes to get through because the receptions were quote-unquote busy. And then when I finally did get through, um, the, the guy on reception, when I said, are you a police officer? He went, oh, absolutely not, no. So I said, well, can you put me through to a police officer? So he put me through to the control room. Now, you'd think to yourself, Andy, that, ah, the control room, yeah, it's manned by officers because, you know, they have to pull out the calls, they have to say, what's this, what's that, what's the other, and they have codes for various calls. No, it, they are not police officers. When I asked the person on the, in the control room whether they were police officer, they said, no, they were a civil servant. Wow. 
So when you ring the police station in Douglas in the Isle of Man, you will not get through to a police officer. But that's not the worst thing, Andy. The worst thing was when I said to this civil servant, um, I'd like to speak to a police officer, this fella said to me, we don't put people through to police officers anymore. You tell me what the problem is, and I will decide whether it warrants police action. So you, there's a civil servant screening the call? There's a civil servant up the police station. There's not just one. I think there's four of them. They screen all calls, and they, a civil servant, a, you know, let's be honest, everyone, everyone says civil servants are just pen pushers. They will decide whether to put you through to a police officer. What do you make of that? I think it's scandalous. I mean, what... What do the police over here actually do all day? They don't. I mean, you looked at the police. The police on the the television the other day with all these these um, uh, Palestinian demonstrations. You know, they have to deal with football hooligans. They have to go around to a house where some deranged father's blowing his children apart with a shotgun. They are. They're the police ones that you should feel sorry for. I mean, the ones over here, with all due respect, they, they, they all they do is issue parking tickets and pull people over for driving the wrong way up a one-way street. They don't. They don't solve crimes. They don't go on the streets. You never see them out and about. And now. We've got a situation where if you want to speak to a police officer to get a bit of advice, you've got to go via a civil servant. And if he doesn't think, because the one I spoke to decided that my question wasn't relevant to be put through to a police officer, he wouldn't put me through. Okay. I mean, can you tell us the nature of what it was? Yeah. Uh, What it was is um, I I had a wing mirror on my car damaged. um, And he said to me, the civil servant said to me about, uh, did any of my neighbours have CCTV? Did I have CCTV? Did the car have um, a dash cam? And when I said no, he said, well, there's not really a lot we can do, is there? So he wouldn't put me through. And all I wanted was a bit of advice as to whether or not... um, I should claim on the insurance for it or whether I should actually pay for it. That's all I wanted. And what did he say regarding the insurance? He said that that's not for him to decide and the policeman wouldn't have given me the advice either. But I'm fairly certain, had I spoke to a police officer, he would have said to me, well, if I were you, I would just pay for it. Keep your no-claims bonus, but pay for it. But the fact that he would not put me through to anybody and the fact that you, anybody that rings up now to the control room at the police headquarters will be screened by a civil servant and that person, who is not qualified in any way, shape or form, legally or by the law, that person will decide whether your call warrants any action. And to be honest, Andy, I actually think that that is terrible. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, just one thing. Uh, let me just pick you up. When you say they don't do anything, well, I mean, obviously they do sometimes because they've just broken up a big uh, drugs hall, haven't they? Yeah, that, those are the those are the, the, the detectives, the ones that you don't see, the ones with the suits and shirt, with the, you know, without the uniform. They are uh, above and beyond reproach. I'm talking about the ones that you're supposedly supposed to see on on the streets, but you don't. I mean, why can't we see them walking up and down the prom? Why do we not see them walking up and down Victoria Street or? Strand Street or along the quay. Why do they have to go out in twos in a van or in a car? You, you look at if you watch some of these uh, documentaries on Sky, you'll, you know you see um, the police in, in 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 Los Angeles or I was watching one the other day in Texas. The guy's on his own. I mean, Texas is not exactly the Isle of Man, but this police officer was on his own. And when he had to pull somebody over, he had to call for backup. Over here, they can't go out unless there's two of them in a vehicle. I mean, is downtown Douglas, is that resembling, as far as uh, the Department of Home Affairs, is downtown Douglas representing downtown Los Angeles? Because if it is, I can't see it. Mm. Why can't get them back out on patrol? It would make people feel much happier for a start because you can approach somebody then if there's something bothering you. But don't, you know, get rid of the civil servants. I I want to speak to a policeman. I don't want to speak to a faceless individual who will decide whether or not I'm going to get um, put through to a police officer. OK. All right, Mark, thanks for calling today. No problem, mate. Have a good one. Good to hear from you. Well, um, I think they're called... Um, well, the first response, I think, when you go to the police station, you'll get a first response from... Uh, I mean, they're not trained police officers, but they are certainly trained. 
So I just wonder how you feel uh, uh, about this. It's an old, um, it's an uh, an oft sort of quoted um, plea that we need more officers on the street. Uh, I don't want to speak for the chief constable. I'm guessing he would say it's down to money. Actually, uh, Russ Foster's going to be on Man in Line. He'll be on early December. Russ will be on. He was on earlier on this year when he'd uh, been in the job a few months. But the chief constable is going to be on. And certainly something, uh, and of course there are many things he can tell us and lots of things he can't tell us. One of them is the fact that they, you know, do you remember last week when there was a problem on the slock and it was closed? They were chasing a drugs gang. They were chasing and they found some drugs there didn't say so at the time. Everybody kind of joined the dots and figured out there was something going on, but it's not something they can say. And part of what they do, gaining intelligence, undercover work, if you like, and tracing where the money goes regarding drugs, they're not going to be able to tell us. So they can't say, you know, a certain number of officers are doing this, a certain number of officers are doing that. But really, it boils down to whether or not you feel comfortable. Are you happy? Do you feel protected by the constabulary on the Isle of Man? Broadly, we are a crime-free society. Certainly, we don't have the day-to-day problems they have in many other places of the world, and certainly not in some of the built-up cities in Scotland, in Wales, in Ireland, and in England. So we are relatively crime-free. We do pay for it. It comes through uh, you know, Department of Home Affairs, Justice and Home Affairs. But just what are your thoughts there? I mean, do you feel you need to speak to a police officer or is somebody who is trained who will tell you whether or not you should speak to a police officer is good enough for you? Any thoughts? Text, email, call and WhatsApp. I mentioned Theresa Cope is on uh, next week. Uh, tomorrow, Theresa Cope's on. Next Monday, Rob Callister, the Onken MHK, will be on. Um, Rob has had lots to say recently. He's been talking about the assisted dying bill. He's been talking about children in care. And in that subject, he knows of what he speaks. We'll also be talking, um, David Ashford, the chair of the Housing and Communities Board, is going to be on. We're out and about at Ramsey Grammar School throughout November. And another constituency, MHK, man in line at the end of November, Michelle Hayward and Juan Watterson will be talking about all things in the South. It's good to talk. It's how we get things done. So when you apply for a personal loan from Black Horse, you'll get support from one of our relationship managers who's there to talk you through your application. You could borrow up to £50,000 with up to seven years to pay it back and you could receive your money within 24 hours of approval. Ready to talk? Go to blackhorseoffshore.co.uk to request a call back today. Finance subject to status. Applicants must be 18 or over. A big thank you to your workmen. They've done a very good job. My property looks like new again. Thank you, EPS. We're delighted with the house. Your employees obviously take great pride in their work. The work was done promptly, professionally and considerately. We're delighted. EPS, transforming properties island-wide with the revolutionary Protex wall covering system. Guaranteed for 10 years. Book now for spring 2024 to get 10% off. Visit eps.company for details. A good job. Well done. EVF, fueling the island and fueling you. With a great range of fresh foods and everyday essentials at our filling stations. And always great offers too. Ellen Van In Fuels. Let's celebrate. With a bang. Douglas Fireworks Display will be bigger and better than ever. Join us on the promenade from 6pm with the Best Guy competition at 6.30 and the incredible display from 7pm. Choreographed to music and broadcast live on Manx Radio on DAB and FM. Douglas Fireworks, Friday, November 3rd. Brought to you by Douglas City Council. Sponsored by Celta Manx and supported by your nation station, Manx Radio. Get ready for another winning weekend on Manx Radio. And this weekend, you can win an emergency first aid at work course plus a universal first aid kit from St John Ambulance. For training courses, room hire, or to find out how you can get involved, visit sja.org.im. Visit manxradio.com and answer the competition question for your chance to win. You can enter as many times as you like. Then make sure you join us on Monday morning for Manx Radio Breakfast when we'll announce the winner. Make this your winning weekend with your nation station, Manx Radio. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. 19 minutes before one, Andy's on now. Hi, Andy. Hi, good afternoon. 
Um, I'm just calling in response to your last caller, um, and I don't know where he's got inf- information from, but um, the fact is you don't end up speaking to a civil servant, as he's calling them. Um, if you go through the police station and there's no one there to take your call, you actually end up speaking to a first contact officer, and they are retired police officers, so they're, they're well-versed with the law um, and for, you know, to help people out. Um, and the fact that he's calling the people in the control room civil servants, um, I think it's quite degrading. OK, so I mean, a, so a, how much of a qualification has the, 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 the first contact officer got? The first contact officer is a retired police officer. I mean, some of the ones up there have served 20-odd years, 25 years in the police force, so they're very qualified to deal with a call coming in. They're not just some faceless civil servant, as he was calling them. Right. Okay. So, I mean, do you understand it? That, I mean, people often think they, when they speak to someone, it's going to be a police officer. So do you think the, do you think the public knows the difference, and does it matter to you? It, it is explained to them when they call in you, that you'll be put through to a first contact officer who deems who, who will go through your call with you. If he thinks it's something that warrants police action, he will get a police officer out to you. But he not, he understands the law. He can help you and assist you or any way possible to get that sorted for yourselves. I mean, if you go through the control room, the control room staff up there aren't just faceless civil servants. Either. They've gone through a rigorous six-month training course before they start work. And they're not just dealing with police. They deal with police, fire and ambulance. And as they always say in that room, nobody ever rings that room when you're having a good day. It's always an awful call coming in. Nobody ever rings you to say how much they're having a nice day. So I think it's quite nasty to say that they're just faceless civil servants. These guys deal with this 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. OK. You know, so... Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, now we've cleared that up. So if they are uh, qualified and if some of them... I mean, are they, are they all retired police officers or just some? All, no, all the first contact officers are the retired police officers. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah. So that's usually where the call comes through and it's for a police matter. If it's not a, a 999 emergency, they will be put through to a first contact officer who will take their details. And if he deems it's something to be dealt with rapidly, they'll get the police out. If it's something that can be dealt with by the next sort of shift coming on, it'll be passed on to them. OK. All right. Appreciate that, Andy. Thanks for calling. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you. Good to hear from you. And Howard's with us now. Hi, Howard. Oh, hello, Andy. Um, yeah, no, just talking, uh, I'll listen to Mark talk on there. Um, I appreciate they've done a joint effort now for the uh, emergency calls. That's They're all going into the same pot, which in a, ble- in a way is a blessing. But um, one thing, and I remember <clears throat> uh, the ex-chief constable uh, saying this, uh, people complaining about not being able to get through, and he said, well, you will be able to get through within seconds uh, with our new system. Yes, you can. You go onto an answer machine, and it's pointing you deliberately to their website. In other words, uh, send them an email, look on the website, look all this, that, and the other. But once you get through all that paraphernalia, and you're there for quite a few minutes listening to all this gibberish, um, and your instance is wanting to try and get in touch with somebody that can answer a question, whether it be on reception or, as that chap has just said now, a first contact officer, uh, not an answer machine with a predetermined message. Uh, and Gary uh, Roberts was quite right. He said, you know, you will get through. But, as I say, it's to a machine. But one instance I had, and people, this uh, I don't ring the police now because of this particular instance. I'm not going to name any names otherwise. But I had cause to ring up and uh, report an instance. And I put what we have, the 141, in front of my number. And um, it went through, and I got the reception, and I got to a first contact officer. And I can say up until that point, everything was excellent. The first contact officer was very good, and I, he said, what's your name? I said, well, no, I said, I'd rather rename, uh, remain anonymous. That's fine. He said, no problem. Um, so went down the line, and about an hour and a half later, I got a phone call. Blah, blah, blah. Hello there. Everything's all right. We've sorted everything out. But several hours later in the afternoon, my phone rang. Hello, Mr. I'm going to say my name because everybody knows Mr. Quayle. Um, What's your date of birth? I said, pardon? Uh, This is WPC, whatever the name was. I said, what do you want that for? 
Oh, it's just because of the uh, phone call this morning. We're just completing the report. We need all your information. I said, I requested to remain anonymous. Oh, I didn't know that, she says. So um, that 141 that I put in uh, was neither here nor there. It was it didn't work. So I was rather annoyed at this, and I rang the communications people, and they said, oh, yes, they can intercept, and they can uh, look that number up. It'll come up on their screen regardless of what 141 is in. And if you want to remain anonymous, well, <laughs> the best thing to do is go to the, um, the Crime Stoppers. And I wrote a letter to the chief constable, and I've still got the letter, and it took about three weeks to get a reply back, and it was, well, it was just a run-of-the-mill letter, and it to give no proper reasons, excuses, or otherwise, it just, well, more or less wrote it off. How do you feel about that, Howard? Well, let's say I haven't rung them on anything since, and I won't. Because uh, my faith in the police on that instance, although the first contact officer was excellent, uh, I'll have no qualms about that. He was very helpful, and the reception were helpful. But after that, it seemed to go downhill. So my um, phone calls to the police now are very, very limited. It would have to be something very serious. Um, and this was a helpful phone call going to the service, and uh, that was how I was treated. Mm. And it's not only me. I wonder how many other people within the system has been treated exactly the same way okay. when they want to remain anonymous. All right. Thanks, Howard. You take care. Bye now. Good to hear from you. Frank's on now. Hi, Frank. Oh, hi, Andy. Uh, what do I do now? Do I see your autograph now you're a TV star? <laughs> <laughs> Dear me. <laughs> oh, dear, I was pleased to see you on the telly, because I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, anyway, <laughs> what I want to tell you about is the police. They're, they're, they're OK in their own way, but there are sometimes not OK. And I, I've had a couple of instances where it's not been me, but my friend was, uh, how can I say, was persecuted by them for no apparent reason. He hadn't done anything wrong. And a lady policeman followed him one day when he was coming into Ramsey and made sure that when he got to Parliament Street, she pulled him over and told him he hadn't stopped at some back road out in the skirts of Ramsey. He didn't stop, which he did stop. But he was taken to court. She said he didn't stop. She prosecuted him. He went to court and he was forced to plead guilty. Now, to me, that's not justice. I fought in my little way with the little bit that I did when I was in the Navy for freedom and freedom of speech and everything else. But how can you force a man to plead guilty? And the reason was he didn't have enough money to pay for a solicitor. So he, he, he said, oh, well, I'll have to plead guilty then. And he got fined 160 odd quid for nothing because he didn't do anything. Do you think that's a fair system we have here in the police? Uh, well, I can't speak about that because I obviously don't know the details, but what, what's your opinion, Frank? Well, I think it's as crooked as, as any criminal parts of it. But other times, it's OK. It's like an up-and-down system. And we had quite a shock a couple of months ago. I've never spoke about this to anyone. But my friend and I were sat in Costa in Parliament Street having a coffee, which was fine. We are just enjoying ourselves chatting like men do about putting the world straight and everything else. And suddenly, three policemen came in, and they were armed. And the gun was showing quite openly, and we didn't. We, you know, was it sort of everybody that saw it sort of looked at it twice and thought, what, "What's going on?" So I went up to the police. I said, "Excuse me, officer, is, is anything going on? We, you know, we got a gun." And, oh no, no, I said that's all right. He said we're just training. Oh, I said okay, but what do you think about armed policing? Because it, it gave us quite a, a little shock to quite a few people in Costa. 
Well, I mean, the fact that we live on the Isle of Man, I mean, that's, I mean, obviously that was shocking at the time, but in retrospect, that's great because we don't see police officers with guns that often. So when we do see them, it, it is a big surprise. Yeah, it was quite, uh, quite, we thought something was going on. And I thought afterwards, well, surely it's not right to sort of be armed, walking about armed. I thought that was illegal in the Isle of Man. It doesn't matter who you are, unless you were going to a, a, a situation where they need to be armed, please. That I can understand. But these were just coming in for a coffee. And to see three men armed was a, a bit of a shock. OK. All right. Got to move on. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Take Bye-bye. care now. Uh, we're on Man in Line. Open line through till one at eight minutes before now. I've just called the Guernsey Bank. Skipped an international about our savings. And did you get a helpful robot? <laughs> no. At Skipped an international, you speak to a very helpful real person. That's refreshing these days. Well, that's why I chose them. For the perfect combination of personal customer service and some of the best savings rates. All by calling 01481 730 730. Or visit skippedinternational.com. Skipton International is licensed to take deposits by the Guernsey Financial Services Commission and is a participant in the Guernsey Banking Deposit Compensation Scheme. Details at dcs.gg. Terms and conditions apply. She found Miss Emily French murdered. The room in disorder, a window smashed. Did you kill Emily French? The service players present one of Agatha Christie's finest thrillers, Witness for the Prosecution, at the Gaiety Theatre on the 9th to the 11th of November. It's not true, I tell you. It's not true! With twists and turns to the last stunning moment for a truly immersive experience, get VIP tickets and join the cast as a juror and watch the whole gripping drama from the stage. Witness for the prosecution. Go to villagaity.com for tickets. There's a new way to Subway with two fantastic menus. Which will you go for? The all-new Subway series with 15 irresistible creations like the Big Bombay Sub, Great Goddess Salad, Emperor Wrap and Big Cheese Steak Sub Melt. Or create your own. You pick the ingredients you want and build your own sub, salad or wrap the way you want it. There's a great mix of healthy and indulgent menu items available from Subway and ShopRite, Peel and Port Erin. Coming to Manx Radio this opportune When the island is black and the boat never sails, the when the weather is howling with wind, I The Clare Witch Project. Our plans which are useless and hopeless. Costly and cumbersome, endless and scurrying. This evening at 8.30 p.m. Listen, if you dare. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Mark's on again. Hi, Mark. All right, fella. Just a quick response to the caller that was on after me, Andy, um, who came on to say that I was incorrect in everything I said. Um, He needs to get his facts right. When you phone the police up and somebody says they're a civil servant, they are a civil servant. I know all about the first responder. You have to, when you were waiting to get through, you have to push one to put through to a a responder. If you can get hold of of a first responder, that is, or, or whatever they call themselves, it's very difficult to get hold of somebody. And then, after you've been on for a certain length of time, it bounces you back to reception. So you still end up with the civil servant. And again, to, just to put him correct, I've spoken to two different people, two, a male and a female, both of them in the control room, and both of them said they were civil servants. Yeah. Neither one of them said they were a trained officer, and neither one of them said they were a first responder. They both said they were civil servants. And Howard was correct in, in saying the police don't want to speak to people these days. They want you to go online and report anything that happens online. They're quite happy to give you their Facebook page and tell you how wonderful they are, but you try getting hold of a police officer. That was my point. Nothing to do with faceless civil servants. My point was I wanted to speak to an officer. And for Andy to come on and say what he said was quite insulting, to be honest with you, Andy. OK, all right, well, we'll clear that up. I've got to dash on. Thanks, uh, Mark. Good to hear from you, because I just want to get John in. Uh, we've only got about a minute left, John, so do what you can. Hi, Andy. Hi, John. I'll be as quick as I can. Okay. During, the COVID lockdown, yeah, during the COVID lockdown, I was working seven days a week. We had a lot of people off work. 
they were vulnerable, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, cut a long story short, a lad next door to me, he lives in two houses. Now, I was absolutely incensed the fact that I was working. I was playing the game, playing by the rules, and he wasn't. So I said to him to his face, listen, maybe if you go from one house to the other and keep doing it, I'm going to bubble you. He said, you what? I said, you heard me loud and clear. He said, I've got to play by the rules, so have you. I'm working seven days a week to keep things together. So off he went about his business. He kept doing it. I reported him. And I didn't hide behind anything. I was upfront about it. I even gave the police my name. So they went to his house, read him the riot act, but guess what? It took a turn, a sinister turn, because he cut to my house. And they tried to give me a hard time, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute. I'm the one playing the game right here. He's not. I can't even understand why you're at my house. But they did read me the riot act. So as far as I'm concerned, it all boils down to the complaints commission they have over here for the police. It is dysfunctional. It doesn't work. Because that particular night, they were totally and completely wrong. They were totally abused in the situation they were in to turn it against me for whatever reason, I don't know. But needless to say, I wouldn't lift a finger to help them again. OK, all right, John, we've got to go. We're out of time, but we appreciate your call. Thanks for calling us today. So it's healthcare tomorrow, Manx Care with Teresa Cope. Thanks to Chris Clerk on the phone. W-A-Y.